Okay, welcome back from lunch. I'm going to get started with our afternoon session of teaching you guys breathing mindfulness meditation. Here I'm going to walk you through and teach you all the ins and outs of breathing mindfulness meditation and give you guys a chance to ask any and all questions that you like. So those of you guys that are joining us online, you guys can ask questions too by putting that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or in Zoom, you can raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. This topic of breathing mindfulness meditation is really important because this is like a foundational teaching. It's a real primary training that the Buddha used because the craving desire attachment is the primary problem that's causing these disconsent feelings. So this is a primary training in addition to other things that's going to help you eliminate your disconsent feelings. So in terms of getting to enlightenment, you wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment without meditation. But you also wouldn't be able to just meditate your way to enlightenment. You need those other teachings that we were talking about with the Eightfold Path. But without meditation, you wouldn't be able to have what you need on board to be able to practice something like right speech or some of these other teachings. So I'm going to teach you you guys the meditation by first starting off with just a few basics to help you guys understand some of the basics of meditation. So first, let's just talk about what meditation is, because depending on where you've learned, depending on what your thoughts are, you might be thinking of one thing as meditation and I might be thinking of something different. So what I do at the very beginning when I teach students meditation is start off with a definition. So you may or may not agree with the definition that I provide, but at least you understand when I say the word meditation, you understand what it is that I'm teaching. So the way I define meditation is like this. Meditation is a technique to actively train the mind during dedicated, independent, purposeful training sessions to eliminate unwholesome qualities of the mind and or cultivate wholesome qualities of the mind in the positions of seated, lying, standing, or walking. So you're eliminating certain unwholesome qualities and you're cultivating certain wholesome qualities in a dedicated, active, purposeful training session. And there's four positions that the Buddha taught, which I'm going to share with you. They're seated, lying, standing, and walking because your body can't permanently be in one fixed position all the time. It's not possible because of the universal truth of impermanence. So you're going to need these different positions at different times. So the Buddha taught these for a reason because you're going to need them and they're going to help you. So you can think of meditation as dedicated, active, purposeful training session to eliminate certain unwholesome qualities and cultivate certain wholesome qualities. And then you're doing that in seated, lying, standing, or walking positions. I also like to talk about what meditation isn't. This is one of the ways to know what meditation is, is by talking about what meditation isn't. This will clarify your understanding of what meditation is. So meditation isn't exercising, walking the dog, gardening, driving, these kinds of things. Sometimes nowadays you'll hear people say, oh, I'm going to go for a drive and meditate, or oh, I'm going to go for a jog and meditate, or I'm going to, you know, go do some gardening and meditate. While these things might be really fun and really helpful for one's life, it might be a certain hobby or activity that they enjoy doing, wonderful. But it's important to be sure that you don't think of those things as meditation, because when you hear me say that you need to meditate two or three times a day, if you went and walked a dog two or three times a day thinking you were meditating, you wouldn't actually be able to get to enlightenment that way. Or if you went to exercise two or three times a day and you thought you were meditating, you actually wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment by only you know exercising or by only gardening. So it's important to understand that when you're out and about in your daily life, you're doing whatever activity it is that you're doing, either exercising, driving, walking the dog, gardening, but those things aren't meditation. You're going to need to practice mindfulness or awareness of mind during those times, but that's not actual meditation. That's the practice of right mindfulness. So when you're meditating, it's this dedicated, active, purposeful training session. And then as you're developing your meditation practice, you're going to need a meditation teacher. Sometimes people think that they can get to enlightenment without a teacher. Only person that would be able to do this would be a Buddha. And that is very rare in the world. The last Buddha that the world's currently aware of existed over 2,500 years ago. Everybody else is going to need a teacher. You can't just read a book. You can't just watch a YouTube video and get to enlightenment. You're going to need to have interaction with the teacher to be able to get help and ask questions and seek information and guidance. So if you would like to consider me your teacher, I'm fine to help you. You don't need to contact me every single day or every single week or every single month. Whenever you need help, just know that I'm here for you, right? If you would like to reach out and ask for help, you can ask for help at any time. 
But if it's not me, find some teacher that you can have a relationship with that you'll be able to reach out to and get help with in your meditation practice. Because there's been students over the years that have contacted me that tried to awaken their mind on their own and they ran into a lot of difficulties. And I usually share this one story with you guys to help you understand how important this is. There's this individual who contacted me several years ago that for two years, they were reading books, they were watching YouTube videos, they were trying to meditate, and they're having all kinds of problems. They started to experience major depression. They started having difficulties with their sleep. They were sleeping 23 hours a day. Uh, they were, uh, their relationships were falling apart. They started having suicidal thoughts. Uh, they were actually a doctor, they were a physician, but they couldn't practice medicine anymore. They couldn't even go to work because they were sleeping for 23 hours a day. Their mind was repetitively saying the same things over and over and over and over again. Uh, this person was having a lot of difficulties in their life. And it's not because meditation is problematic. It's that this person was trying to get to enlightenment by themselves, not realizing that only a Buddha is actually able to do that. An average person wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment by themselves. You're going to need teachers and guides to be able to help you. So this person eventually reached out to me and he found me and he's like, hey, I need your help. You know, you know, this is what's going on in my life. You know, can you help me? I tried to help him for about three or four months over the internet, but it just wasn't working out that well. So I invited him to come to Thailand and I suggested that he come here and he came here and he spent some time here and I helped him while he was here. And then he went home to his home country and eventually he worked himself out of those difficulties because he got the help and the guidance that he needed. But for about four to six years, his life was a wreck and he really uh, was experiencing a lot of pain. And he did end up uh, getting back to work and all of those things and now he's living a very very healthy life, but he did lose his relationship with his fiance that fell apart. But the only reason why this was occurring is because he didn't realize he didn't have the wisdom that he couldn't do this by himself, that he needed help from a teacher. So even if you just have something going on in your meditation practice and once every six months, once a year, you end up contacting a teacher and saying, hey, um, this is what's going on in my meditation practice. Is this normal? And if what you get back from your teacher is yes, that's completely normal, keep going, then that can give you some reassurance. That can give you some confidence. And you'll find that you'll be able to make progress in your journey to enlightenment and developing your life practice. So it's important to have somebody you can reach out to because you can't ask a book questions. So as long as you have a teacher of some sort, this will really help you because if you're out there on your own, you can run into a lot of difficulties. And I don't suspect that any of you guys will experience those same things that this person experienced because you have someone that, he, that can help you. The only reason why this occurred is because for two years, he was doing all these things that he didn't understand what he was doing. And that's why he worked himself into these difficulties. But it wasn't until he ended up connecting with the teacher that he was able to work himself out of those difficulties. So as long as you have somebody that you can reach out to occasionally as you need help, you shouldn't experience any of those challenges or difficulties. Then in terms of meditation positions as part of meditation basics, there's four different positions that the Buddha taught, seated, lying, standing, and walking. And you're gonna need these at different times for different reasons. I'll explain to you what these are and how I use them, but just like I teach you everything, don't believe me, right? You're not interested in believing anybody. I'm just gonna share with you as guidance how I use these positions, and then you use them and see what works best for you. You're gonna need to practice and see in what situations these positions work best for you. So the seated position, usually you're sitting on the floor with a cushion and your legs lightly crossed, or you could be in a chair or on a sofa or on a bench or something like that. You're in the seated position. This tends to be the primary position that people uh, meditate in. I would say 80 or 90% of the meditation I've done has been in the seated position. And if you're on the floor, Oftentimes people put cushions under their rear, they put their legs off the mat, and this helps to get the hips up in the air, and this lessens the angle at the hips, the knees, and the ankles. But you might also just decide to sit on the mat too. It's whatever is comfortable for you. But having your legs lightly crossed is best, because if they're real tight and you're experiencing pain, you're not going to be able to train the mind. So you'd like your legs to just be lightly crossed. And if you're in a chair, you can just put your feet flat on the floor or, or cross at the ankles. There's, there's no certificates given out for sitting on the floor. 
There's no awards given out for sitting on the floor. So if you're in any pain and you need to sit in a chair, it would be wise to sit in a chair. So you might end up using this um, seated position as a go-to position for you. The Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together and he put this in his lap. And if this is comfortable, you could use it. But sometimes people use other positions. You might put your palms on your thighs, or your knees, or your palms up. Some people just put their hands in their lap. It's finding whatever is comfortable for you. There's not just one set way. It would be helpful if you have your upper body erect. This keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. And having your sternum up and your shoulders back, it helps you to breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. So this is kind of the way that you would like to set up for seated meditation, whether you're on the floor, in a chair, or some other way. But when you're in the seated position, sometimes you might notice that you're falling asleep or you're dozing off, or you might notice that you're experiencing pain or something like this. So if you're noticing pain in the body, that's where lying position comes in, where you're lying on the floor, face up. This is referred to in yoga, I think, as resting pose or corpse pose or shavasana or something like this. This is where you're just laying on your back, face up, and your palms out to the side. All your muscles are completely relaxed. This is really good if you notice any pain in the body. Because if you ever experience pain during meditation, that's an indication to you that something's not going well. And you should adjust your body position, either in that position or just change to a different position. So if I was experiencing pain in my back, for example, while sitting, I would try to adjust a little bit while I'm in meditation and while I'm in this position. But if I couldn't get rid of the pain, I would just lie down and then you get rid of the pain because all your muscles are completely relaxed. So that's where lying position comes in. But you need to be careful with lying position because you can be dozing off and you can fall asleep and you're not going to be able to get your meditation in. Same thing can happen with seated position too. And that's where standing position comes in. When you stand up, you just stand up with your two feet together side by side. Your arms can either be at your sides or you can grasp them in the front just lightly or, or clasp them in the back behind you, whatever is comfortable for you. And you just stand there with your eyes closed, still doing the same thing with the mind that you would do in a seated or lying position, but you're just doing it in the standing position. So this would be really good if you're dozing off and falling asleep and you would like to extend your meditation session. I've also used this at times when I've been standing at a bus stop or something like that and I knew that the bus wasn't coming for 15, 20 minutes and I would like to get a little bit of meditation in, maybe five minutes here, 10 minutes there. Um, it wasn't one of my main meditations for that day, but just a little touch up meditation here or there. Or sometimes I was like in line waiting somewhere like at the DMV and you know you're going to be standing there and it's, this line only moves like once every 20 minutes or once every 10 minutes. And rather than just stand there and look at the sky and look at the floor, I just stood there and did meditation. And then when the mind line moved forward, I would just move forward, right? So you can use it for those situations too. And then there's walking position. Where walking position comes in, this is really good also if you're falling asleep and you're dozing off, but it's also really good if you have an overactive mind and the last thing you're thinking about is sitting down and being still. You might have those kinds of situations where you have a lot of energy in the mind and it's overactive. You can do walking meditation instead. And this is a, a meditation where you're slowly, intentionally walking, and this will help you to get out all the energy. And you can actually interchange between these positions where you could start with walking and switch to seated or maybe you start with seated and you switch to walking. You can switch between these or you can just do one position and do that whole position for the entire meditation. I'm going to teach you walking position tomorrow as our afternoon session. We're going to be doing walking meditation here at the temple. And for those of you guys online, I'm going to set it up in such a way that you can learn too. I have a camera that uh, will be able to follow me as I walk around. So uh, you'll be able to learn walking meditation as part of this course. So these are the four positions and the way that I use them. But again, don't believe me. You figure out what works best for you in any given situation. And you can interchange these and figure out in what situations work best for you. And these are how I've used these positions. And you might find other ways to use them as well. So these are some of the basics. Now, what I'll share with you are how to start and conduct your meditation session. The first thing is when the Buddha talks about meditation and you can see his guidance and his teachings, you can see where he's guiding his students and the instructions that he's providing to meditate. He talks about setting up mindfulness in front of you 
before you start meditating. When he describes meditation and he actually guides his students, he talks about setting up mindfulness in front of you. Well, now you know what mindfulness is. It means awareness of mind. So what he's saying is develop some awareness of mind before you enter into meditation. Don't just plop down into meditation and start trying to meditate because it's going to take you 5, 10, 15 minutes before you can start getting benefit in that meditation. Whereas if you set up mindfulness in front of you, meaning bring some awareness of mind to the mind before you start meditating, you can actually be getting benefit right from the beginning. So that's why I taught you guys chanting yesterday because chanting is how I develop awareness of mind before I enter into meditation. I will typically go to the bathroom, empty out the organs. I will then kind of like you know, get to a position, take whatever position I'm going to take. And then I will start chanting as a way to bring some awareness to the mind and awareness to the breath, which is what we talked about yesterday. So if you'd like to use chanting, you can, but if you don't use it, figure out something else where you can develop awareness of mind before you enter into meditation. Then it's also important to remember the mind is the boss and the body is the employee. This is usually what I start with at the beginning, is the mind is the boss, the body is the employee. The reason why this is important to keep in mind is that you have to go through the employee in order to get to the boss, right? You always have to go through the employee to get to the boss. Well, if the employees are luxurious, they're not gonna take you to go see the boss because they're luxurious, they're complacent. But also, if the employees are painful, and they're disgruntled, they're not going to take you to go see the boss either. So you need the employees to be comfortable and in the middle to take you to go see the boss. So the body, you would like the body to be comfortable, not luxurious and not painful so that it'll take you to go see the boss so you can train the mind. So if you remember that, that the mind is the boss, the body is the employee, the body is just following and doing whatever is in the mind. The only reason why these hands and arms are moving is because the mind is trying to get the, the body to do that. And the body is following along. The body's following whatever's going on in the mind. The mind's the boss. The body wouldn't do anything by itself. That's why when we die and the mind's gone, the body just lays there. It can't function unless there's a mind. So the mind's the boss, the body's the employee, and you'd like to go through the employee in order to get to the mind. So you need this body to be comfortable. At any point that you experience pain in the body, just shift your position or change positions to a completely different position, and that'll keep the employee comfortable. And then in terms of your time, frequency, and schedule of meditation, you would like to gradually build up to two or three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more. And right now that could seem like a lot, depending on what you've got going on in your life. But remember, this is gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. You're not gonna be able to just snap your fingers and instantly start doing that. What you'll notice is frequency is more important than the duration of your meditation. But as you start clearing out more and more things in your life, you'll be able to make more space for meditation because there's probably certain unbeneficial things that you're doing in your life right now that if you cleared those things out, you would actually have more time for meditation. So if you look at your life, maybe you're searching social media for two, three, four hours a day. Maybe you're watching YouTube videos for two, three, four hours a day. If you started clearing some of that stuff out, not that you have to completely eliminate it, but if you just clear that out, it'll give you more time to perhaps dedicate to meditation and you can gradually build up your practice. So because frequent is more important than duration. If you have the option of doing one session for 30 minutes or two for 15, go for the two for 15. That would be more beneficial for you. And then gradually expand that 15 minutes to longer and longer over a period of time, maybe six months, a year, two years, you gradually build up to two or three sessions for 30 minutes or more. You're not going to be able to have a fixed schedule of meditation. If you kind of walked away from this course thinking, all right, I'm going to meditate every day at 8 a.m. That's what I'm going to do every day. That's my decision. Every single day I'm going to meditate at 8 a.m. Well, the universal truth of impermanence tells you that that's not possible. There's no way that you can meditate at 8 a.m. every day. It's just not going to happen, right? I've been in my room meditating before. My son walks in. He's like, dad, I need you to take me to school. I'm like, really? I thought your mom was going to take you to school. He's like, yeah, me too, but she's already gone. She's not even here. I need you to take me to school. I'm like, all right, well, stop my meditation, go take him to school, come back and meditate afterwards, right? Whereas if I had this fixed, rigid schedule, if I had an attachment, 
a craving to meditate, I would have been angry. I would have been frustrated. I would have been agitated. But if you understand your meditation practice is impermanent, then you can just let go, go take your son to school, come back and meditate later. No big deal, right? But if you had this fixed, rigid schedule, you'll be agitated. So there's nothing special about 3.30 in the morning that you have to meditate every day at 3.30 in the morning. You'll hear this sometimes from some people like, oh, you have to meditate at 6 a.m. in the morning. That's like the perfect time to meditate. There's nothing special going on in the world at 3.30 in the morning that's going to make your meditation any better at 3.30 in the morning as 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, or 11 o'clock. So what I suggest you do is the same thing the Buddha did. The Buddha didn't have a timepiece to keep track of time. They didn't have accurate, concise time during his lifetime. So what he did is he meditated morning, midday, and evening. You can see it right in his teachings. They say he meditated morning, midday, and evening. He didn't have a, a timepiece to keep precise time. So if he didn't have a timepiece, you don't need one either, right? So if you have these anchor points where you're planning to meditate like morning and evening, you know, somewhere in the morning, you know, probably eight, nine, 10 o'clock, whenever you wake up somewhere around there, you're probably going to meditate. Somewhere in the evening, you're probably going to meditate. In the evening, you'd like to meditate before your mind gets sleepy. So if you normally go to bed at say 10 p.m., probably somewhere around 9, 915, you'd like to be starting to meditate. Because if you wait until you know, 9.45 or 10 and you're already sleepy, you can't do that dedicated, active, purposeful training session. So you're going to need to kind of back it up. But you could also do it at like 5 or 6 or 7 p.m. as well. There's no harm in doing it there as well. What I do is I meditate morning and evening. So what I'll do is I'll wake up, go empty the organs, come back, and I'll start meditating usually right away. And then in the evening, before I go to sleep, I will meditate. And then this way, I go to sleep with some good meditation and I wake up with some good meditation. And then all day long, you're having a great day. And then somewhere in the middle of the day, if you're able to get a midday meditation in, great. But again, it's just an anchor point somewhere around the middle of the day. It doesn't have to be fixed, rigid schedule. Also, if you notice that you're using an alarm and when you're using an alarm, you might experience one of two things. If you set an alarm that you're going to meditate for 20 minutes, you might be in meditation thinking, is it time yet? Is it time yet? Is it time yet? Is it time yet? This is like craving. This is the mind longing, yearning to know if it's time yet. If you're noticing the mind's doing that, where possible, I suggest that you don't use a timer. Like maybe in the evenings or on the weekend, don't use a timer. But if you're on your way to work and you only have 20 minutes, and if you went longer than that, you'd be late for work, you might decide to use a timer, right? But if you don't need one, it's best to not use one because your mind's going to be going, is it time yet? Is it time yet? Is it time yet? And this is just craving. Or the other thing you might be doing is you might be deep in meditation, getting all kinds of benefit, and then, ing, 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 ing. oh man, why did I set that alarm? I could have got so much more benefit, right? So if you don't set an alarm, it'll actually help you. This is like trying to determine the future. It's like 20 minutes from now, I will not be meditating. You don't even know what you're going to be doing one minute from now right? There could be an earthquake and we all have to run out of this building. We don't know, right? We don't even know what we're doing one minute from now. How could we know what we're going to do 20 minutes from now? So if you set an alarm, it's like you're trying to decide what you're going to be doing 20 minutes from now and you don't necessarily know. You need to reside in the present moment. So if you just go into meditation, meditate for as long as you need, and then when you're done, you're done. Right? If you'd like to keep track of your time, because you're going to need to check to see if you're within 30 minutes, look at your clock before you go into meditation. Okay, 9 a.m. Now you know. You started at 9 a.m. You start meditating. And then when you're done, you look at the clock again. Ah, 9.15. Okay, I've got 15 minutes of meditation. So next time, I'd like to try to expand that a little bit. So about once a week, check in on your time and see how long you've been meditating. Where you need an alarm, use it. But if you don't need one, it's best to not use it. Then in terms of your sleepiness during meditation, you might notice that you're dozing off and falling asleep. You kind of have one or two options. One, you could change your position. Move from a seated or lying to a standing or a walking, right? That's one way that you could do it. Or the second option is you could just go to sleep. Right? Maybe you need some rest. Maybe you're not sleeping so well. And as you're meditating, you're dozing off to sleep. Just get some rest. When you first start meditating, your mind is working a lot because your mind is more heavily polluted when you first start on your journey to enlightenment. So initially, the first three to six months or so, your mind's having to do a lot of work to meditate. So you might notice you get tired more frequently. 
But also because your mind's finally getting what it needed, which is this meditation, your mind might be like, ah, thank you so much for that meditation. Now I would like to relax. I'd like to rest. It's kind of like a dry sponge. This dry sponge is finally getting the water that it wants. And it's like, wow, I can be a sponge again. I feel like really loose. I feel good. Your mind's the same way. When you finally start giving it its meditation that it's been needing all these years, it might be like, wow, I really am interested in sleeping now. I haven't been getting good sleep for the last five years, 10 years, 20 years, perhaps, depending on how long you've been alive. You might not have been getting very good quality sleep. And now that your mind's starting to function more optimally with the meditation, it might be more interested in sleep. So if you need sleep, just get some sleep. Those are the two ways you can handle it. You can change your position if you like, or you can just get some sleep and then meditate when you wake up. You might notice physical sensations during meditation. This is like the little itches and stuff like this. Like if you're meditating, you might notice an itch. You got some options here. One thing is you could just stay in meditation, right? Just stay in meditation. Just try to keep your mind focused on the breath. And you know that itch is there, but you also know it's impermanent. It's not permanent. It's going to arise. It's going to change and it's going to fade away. It's not permanent. I guarantee you, right? So when you're in meditation, you could just stay focused on the breath. And this is really good training for your mind to see if you can focus on the breath. I've even had bugs come around. I've had like flies crawling around on my head. I've had them come down on my nose, go up into my nose. I've had them go into my ears while you're meditating. And it's like a challenge to try to stay focused on meditation and focused on the breath. This is actually helping you, assisting you. What you choose to do in those situations is up to you, but I chose to see if I could still meditate with that thing going on. So if this itch is happening, if you can stay focused on the breath, this will be really good training for your mind. But sometimes you might be in meditation and uh, the urge is just there to scratch and you might just decide to scratch. And maybe that took you five seconds to get to that point. Well, next time, try to make it eight seconds or 10 or 12. Try to expand it a little bit. And then the next time, try to make it 15 or 20 seconds. And eventually, get to the point where you can focus on the breath, you see the itch, you can see it changing, and you can see it fade away. And you know that it's impermanent. So this is how you can deal with the physical sensations. If you ever notice pain during your meditation, change your position. There's no sense to sit there and experience the pain because if you're trying to train your mind to develop wholesome qualities and eliminate unwholesome qualities, you're not going to be able to do that if all you experience is pain, 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 pain. So if you're noticing any pain, just shift your body in that position or change to a different position. Then you might notice visual stimulation during your meditation. This is where you might see colors. You might have vivid imagery. Some people see colors of green or purple or white or different images that might occur. This is completely normal. This is uh, the brain actually changing. There's nothing special that's happening. Sometimes people think like, oh, I saw green. What does that mean? Am I going to get rich? Is that what that means? Or, oh, I saw purple. Does that mean my boyfriend or girlfriend's going to come back to me? What does that mean? There's nothing that that means in terms of those kinds of things. I'll share with you what's going on. What's happening is you're training your mind and you're uplifting the pollution out of your mind. The brain and the mind are two different things, but there's a connection between them. And as you're cleaning up your mind, it has a positive effect to the brain. Doctors, researchers, scientists are starting to study these things. They have MRIs and CAT scans that they can see the physical structures of the brain are changing for people who meditate. And as your brain is making those physical changes, it can produce different colors and different images because the sight that you experience is actually happening inside the brain. The eye is just a lens that's pulling in the light, but the sight is actually happening inside the brain. So as the physical structures of the brain are changing, you can experience different colors and different imagery inside the mind. You can see those things. So if those things are occurring, you don't have to run out and try to figure out what they mean. It's actually just the brain is physically changing. Not only can you sometimes see things, but you might even hear things. Sometimes when I was meditating, I could hear the brain physically changing. It was like, you could hear it, 
right? There was a long time where I went around life. I had a lot of pressure in my skull. I used to have migraine headaches about three times a week. Sometimes I would even vomit. They were so bad that as I trained my mind and the physical structures of the brain were changing, I didn't experience that pressure in the skull anymore. I didn't experience headaches anymore. So you might notice these physical structures in your brain changing. You might hear it or you might see it as it's occurring. So these are normal if you experience visual stimulation during your meditation. Then um, this one here, meditation with external stimulus. This is like if you've been taught to meditate with candles or incense or beads or music or something like this. This is all things that the mind can get attached to and that the mind's holding on to. And what I would suggest you do is let those things go. Because if you can only meditate when you have those special beads or when you have that special candle, then when you're three days into your mountain trek in the mountains of Chiang Mai, you're not going to be able to meditate because you don't have your special candle with you, right? You would like to get to the point where you only need three things to meditate. And you're going to have these three things with you your entire life. The body, the mind, and the breath. Those are the only three things that you need to meditate. The body, the mind, and the breath. That's it. So if you have beads or candles or incense, and that's what you're using now, no big deal. That's what you're doing now. That's what's led you to this point. But now what you like to do is start stripping that stuff out of your practice so you can get down to the point where you're just meditating with the body, the mind, and the breath. So that that way, no matter where you are, at any time, you can meditate. I've been places before where somebody invited me somewhere and I went there and it was like a park or something and I was walking around the lake and I was like, wow, this is such a beautiful place. I'd like to meditate. Well, I can sit down and meditate because all I need is the body, the mind, and the breath. I didn't have to go home and get my special candle and then come back and then start meditating. I could just sit down and start meditating because my mind's not attached to anything. One time I got into a motorbike accident and I was in the hospital and I didn't have anything with me. I could meditate. Because I was just laying there in the hospital bed, hooked up to an IV, and I could still meditate. I didn't need my special candle or anything like that. So if you're using any kind of phone apps or any of those kinds of things now, I suggest you gradually and slowly kind of strip those away out of your practice. And usually the way the unenlightened mind works is that it craves permanence. It wants things to be permanent. So it doesn't like impermanence. It doesn't like change. So if you start implementing change into your meditation practice, your mind might kind of revolt on you. It might be like fighting you. So the way that I suggest you do it is gradually. So you could do like one session with your special candle or your phone app or whatever it is, and then do one session without it. And then do one session with it and one session without it. One session with it, one session without it. And then after you do that for a week or so, then you do one session with it, two sessions without it. One session with it, two sessions without it. And then gradually you expand that to three or four or five. And eventually you get to the point where you're like, yeah, I don't need this candle anymore. I don't need this incense. I don't need this phone app because your mind is fully adjusted. So if you take small little incremental steps like that, moving towards something more wholesome, your mind will kind of acclimate to that more readily. And it's the same thing when you're letting go of anything, whether it's smoking cigarettes or uh, whether it's coffee or any of these other things that you might need to let go of at some point. If you gradually move away from it, your mind will thank you for that. Because if you go away too abruptly, your mind's going to kind of have a, a lot of strong feelings because of that. So you can do this with your meditation practice too. It's just kind of gradually go away from some of these things. Do you guys have any questions on this? Those of you in Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, you can ask questions as well by putting that into the comment section or raising your hand in Zoom. Any questions here? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is share with you some words of the Buddha on meditation because I'm not interested in you believing me that the Buddha even taught meditation, right? I'm going to share with you the four types of meditation that the Buddha taught, but first I'm going to share with you his words so you can see why I teach you the way that I do. This is an excerpt from one of his discourses. Before this, he was talking to his students and he was teaching them five things that they needed to do in order to develop their life practice in order to get to enlightenment. And then he gets to this point in his discourse and he says, having based himself on these five things, meaning the five things that he just talked about, the monk should further develop another four things. And this is where he kind of highlights his four meditations. 
The perception of unattractiveness of the body should be developed to abandon lust. This is a meditation to eliminate sexual craving. If you have an extensive amount of sexual craving, you're trying to minimize that or reduce it or eliminate it, there's a meditation for you to help you do that. Loving kindness should be developed to abandon ill will. This is a meditation to help you eliminate anger, frustration, and ill will and all the lesser versions. Med, uh, mindfulness of breathing or breathing mindfulness meditation should be developed to cut off thoughts. This is why you're guided to meditate in the way that you are with breathing mindfulness meditation. You're cutting off the thoughts. You're cutting off the thoughts. You're not trying to eliminate your thoughts. You're trying to get discipline of the mind to let them go and let them go and let them go. And then the perception of impermanence should be developed to eradicate the conceit, I am. When one perceives impermanence, the perception of non-self is stabilized. One who perceives non-self eradicates the conceit, I am, which is nibbana or enlightenment in this very life. What he's talking about here is realizing non-self. That in order to realize non-self, you have to eliminate the I am, the self-identity. So I've taken these four meditations and I've put them into this configuration to be able to help you understand what you're actually learning and what you're practicing. So we're talking about breathing mindfulness meditation in this class because that's what is the foundational meditation that you need, but there's these others as well. So breathing mindfulness meditation is the primary form of meditation that you're going to need in order to get to enlightenment. And remember, I shared how meditation is either eliminating certain unwholesome qualities of mind or it's cultivating certain wholesome qualities. Well, here I'm showing you the unwholesome quality that you're eliminating with breathing mindfulness meditation is craving desire attachment. And the wholesome qualities that you're cultivating are mindfulness or awareness of mind and concentration or singleness of mind. That's what you're developing as a wholesome quality in breathing mindfulness meditation. You're essentially exercising your mind in meditation and then you're using those qualities in daily life to be able to help you. So that now in daily life with your mindfulness or awareness of mind and your concentration with your focus and clarity, whenever you see craving, desire, attachment coming up in the mind where the mind is longing and yearning for something, you can cut that off and let it go. So say your mind sees that brand new pair of shoes in the mall and you're like, oh man, I want that brand new pair of shoes. Oh, I just got to have those shoes. But then when you see your mind longing and yearning for that with your mindfulness, then you can cut off and let go applying right effort. You can cut it off and let it go because you know like, hey, I've got 30 pairs of shoes at home. What do I need one more pair of shoes for? How's it going to help me? How's it going to improve my life? That's just the mind longing yearning. It's very expensive to have craving desire attachment. You can work yourself into a lot of debt if you have a lot of craving desire attachment because your mind just keeps wanting more and more and more and more and more. It's like an unquenchable thirst. So in this meditation of breathing mindfulness meditation, you're developing mindfulness or awareness of mind, concentration, and the ability to easily let go, let go, let go. You're not eliminating your thoughts. You're training your mind to let them go. So when we talk about cutting off your thoughts, you're disciplining the mind or building that control where you can now control the mind because you can see with mindfulness that your mind's longing, yearning and pulling towards something and then you cut it off. Right? If you see that, hey, you'd like to apply for a new job and you see your mind longing, yearning and chasing after it, you can cut it off and you can bring the mind to the middle and now gradually work towards getting that new job rather than chasing after it. Right? If you see your mind chasing after a boyfriend or girlfriend, instead of that, gradually work towards that goal. Right, That would be the middle way, is gradually work towards a goal rather than chase and chase and chase and chase it. So where you see your mind with mindfulness chasing something, you can cut it off. You can restrain it, kind of pulling back the reins of a horse. If you've ever ridden a horse, you pull back the reins and slow it down. So that's what you're going to need to do with your mind. So the breathing mindfulness meditation is going to help you to develop the qualities to be able to do that, is to restrain your mind and pull it back. These others we're going to talk about in other classes and courses and retreats that you guys might decide to take. But in this foundational program, we just talk about this one, the breathing mindfulness meditation, helping you to understand that. Here's some more words from the Buddha on meditation. He says, a pot without a stand is easy to tip over. This is one of his teachings. A pot without a stand is easy to tip over. What he's saying is the pot is the mind 
the stand is your meditation practice. A mind without a meditation practice is easy to become discontent. That's what he's saying. A pot without a stand is easy to tip over. A mind without a meditation practice is easy to become angry and frustrated and irritated. So if you're not meditating right now, you might have like a little dowel rod. Your pot might be kind of teeter-tottering on this little dowel rod. But as you meditate more and more, this stand becomes wider and wider and wider and wider, and it's harder and harder to tip over the pot. Eventually, you get to a point where your mind's so stable, it's impossible for anybody to tip over your mind, that your mind can't be shaken up by anything whatsoever. But right now, that might not be the case. So you'd like to work on developing this stand, make this stand wider and wider and wider, and then your pot won't tip over. Then here's some words where he's talking about how important breathing mindfulness meditation is. He says, monks, there is one thing that when developed and cultivated, leads exclusively to liberation, to freedom from strong feelings, to elimination, to peace, to direct knowledge or experience, to enlightenment, to nibbana. What is that one thing? Mindfulness of breathing, breathing mindfulness meditation. This is that one thing that, when developed and cultivated, leads exclusively to liberation, to freedom from strong feelings, to elimination, to peace, to direct knowledge or experience, to enlightenment, to nibbana. So he's not saying you only need one thing in order to get to enlightenment. Otherwise, he would have just taught meditation and that's it. He wouldn't have taught anything else. What he's saying is if you're doing breathing mindfulness meditation, the only goal of that is to get to enlightenment. That's the only purpose for this meditation is to get to enlightenment. It's kind of like saying your car, it leads to one thing, transportation. But you need other things in your life besides transportation. You need food and water and clothing and other things like this. But that's essentially what he's saying is, you know, this car leads to one thing. It leads to transportation. This meditation, it leads to one thing. It's enlightenment. That's what it leads to. So you would need this meditation in order to be able to get to enlightenment is to develop the mind because what's causing the discontent feelings is craving, desire, attachment. So the way that you eliminate your discontent feelings is you need to eliminate the cravings, desires, attachments. This is the meditation that's going to help you to accomplish that. There's other things you need too, as we talked about with the Eightfold Path, but this is a primary form of training that you're going to need to develop and get underway and consistently practice it. And of course, you're going to probably miss a session here or there. This is normal, right? Your meditation and your enlightenment, it's not going to be determined whether you miss meditation tonight or tomorrow. Your enlightenment isn't going to be determined whether you miss one or two or three meditations in a given month because you're going to miss meditation occasionally, right? That's impermanence. Your enlightenment is going to be determined on if you miss meditation today, what are you going to do next? Are you going to then make extra effort to meditate tomorrow or are you just going to forget all about it and don't care about meditation and just let your mind continue to be angry and frustrated and irritated? If you can put together two, three, four, five, six years of meditation where you're consistently meditating over that period of time, realizing that you are going to miss a session here and there, you can get to enlightenment, right? So you're not going to be able to make every single meditation. There's going to be some days where you might not meditate or you might meditate once and that's it. That's okay. Just slowly, gradually build up your practice where over a consistent long-term period, you have more of a tendency to meditate two or three times a day than not. And where you miss meditation, just the next day, be sure that you get into it and be sure that you're meditating. There was a period of time where I didn't meditate for three years. It was the worst three years of my life, but eventually I got back into it. It was really hard. When your mind's complacent, The longer you allow it to stay in the complacency, the harder it will be to get back into meditation. So if you notice one or two days you haven't been meditating, jump right back into it. Don't allow that to be one or two weeks or one or two months. Get right back into it. And that way your mind won't become complacent. So here, this is the Buddha explaining how important breathing mindfulness meditation is. And out of this book series, I devoted one book to the consolidated teachings of the Buddha on meditation. So if you're interested in seeing that, out of the 45 volumes of the Pali Canon, it's been consolidated down into one book and you can see all the different teachings from the Buddha on breathing mindfulness meditation. These are just a couple of those. Then in terms of actually doing the meditation, you would like to focus on the breath, either the sound or the sensation of air moving into the nose. 
The breath is the present moment. So by focusing on the breath, you're focusing the mind in the present moment. But as you know, the unelated mind, it wants to be in the past or it wants to be in the future. It is not usually interested in being in the present moment. It's going to be in the past or it's going to be in the future. So that's where when you see your mind longing, yearning, you cut it off and you bring the mind back to the breath. And more and more, your mind will stay in the present moment. So as you focus on the breath, remember that's the present moment. That's the present moment. That's right now. And you would like to keep bringing the mind back to the breath. The breath is like this post or this pillar. And if you had six animals tied to this post or pillar and they were pulling in all these different directions, like the monkeys going to the jungle, the birds going to the sky, the snake is going to the anthill, the, the alligator or crocodiles going to the river and they're pulling all these different directions, the animals would pull but then they would get yanked back to the post or pillar and they would pull and they would get yanked back and pull and get yanked back. Eventually, as they keep doing that countless times, eventually they get tired. They're going to get exhausted and they're going to sit down and they're going to be still at that post and pillar. They're not going to pull anymore. So your mind is the same way. The breath is the post or the pillar. And it's going to keep pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling. And you're going to keep yanking it back and yanking it back and yanking it back and yanking it back and yanking it back. And eventually your mind's going to get tired. And it's going to say, all right, I'm just going to sit here. And this is where it takes many years to train your mind. But eventually it's going to get tired. It's going to say, all right, I'm just going to stay in the present moment. Because every time it pulls, you yank it back and you yank it back and you yank it back. And this just takes time for your mind to learn this, that every time it pulls, you're going to keep yanking it back and yanking it back. Okay? So the goal of this meditation, it isn't to eliminate your thoughts. Sometimes people think that's the case based on the guidance. The goal is to notice them sooner and sooner. And when they do occur, cut them off and let them go and bring the mind back to the breath. So if 20, 30, 50 times during your meditation, you have to let go and let go and let go, this is really good for your mind. Really, really, really helpful. Because then you've trained your mind to let go, to let go, to let go. Even when you're enlightened, you're still going to have thoughts during meditation. You're still going to have thoughts. It's just that you're going to have an occasional thought. There's going to be this peace and this joy in your mind. And you're going to have an occasional thought. Still, even when you're enlightened. But when you have that thought, you're going to notice it right away. And you're going to be able to easily cut it off and let it go. Where right now, you might have a bombardment of thoughts. It might be like thought, 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 and then you have to let it go after a while, this is completely normal. But over time, you would like to notice them sooner and sooner and let them go easier and easier. That's what you'd like to build up to. Okay? So this is also words from the Buddha. He says, meditate, monks. Do not be complacent, lest you regret it later. This is my instruction to you. The way that I say that is never give up. Don't allow the mind to be complacent because if you give up on your meditation practice, that's like saying, I'm just going to be angry for the rest of my life. I'm just going to be sad for the rest of my life. I'm just going to be guilty and feel shameful and bored and lonely. Yeah, I'm just going to accept it. If you don't be complacent, then you'll actually be able to make your way closer and closer to enlightenment. What the Buddha is saying about don't be complacent lest you regret it later when you're angry and you're frustrated and you're feeling sorrowful and grieving, you'll regret having not meditated, right? This is like the closest thing you'll get to from the Buddha where he's like, come on, you know, do your work, go, go meditate, right? So when you're angry or frustrated, you'll regret it later. One time my son went to school and he saw a movie at school and it was like a horror movie. It was like a scary movie. And he came home and he was having trouble sleeping that night. And it was like, he usually goes to sleep around 8 or 8.30. It was 11 o'clock and he still couldn't go to sleep. And he was telling me, he's like, Daddy, Daddy, I'm scared. I can't go to sleep. And I was like, you haven't been meditating, have you? Because he doesn't meditate much. He was like, nope. I said, see, the words of the Buddha, you'll regret it later when you don't meditate. His mind was holding on. It was clinging to that 
you know, horror movie that he was watching, he couldn't let it go. So once you train your mind to let things go, they won't plague you. You won't feel that stress and anxiety. You can let go of things. So you'll regret it later if you don't meditate. And that's what the Buddha is sharing with you. It's just to encourage you and help you and support you to say, yeah, don't ever give up. Okay. So any questions on, on any of this? Okay, let me see if we have any questions here. No questions online either. Okay, so it's about 10 minutes to three, and we usually end class at three, but because we went a little bit extra with the Eightfold Path, uh, that cut into any potential meditation. I can stick around and meditate with you guys. Usually that's what I do at this point is meditate with you guys. If you'd like to stick around, you're welcome to stick around and I'll meditate with you guys and guide you in a meditation session. If you need to leave and you would like to leave, of course, you guys know you can always come and go as you please. You're not required to be here. Um, but let me just check in with you guys. Are you guys interested in meditating or would you like to in class here? you like to meditate? Meditate? Okay. You guys like to meditate? Okay. Do you need like a little five minute bio break to use the restroom or anything? Anyone need a restroom? No? Okay. So why don't we meditate together then? I'll do the same things that we've been doing, which is chanting. And you guys are welcome to follow along and chant with me to ease into meditation. Then I'll provide you some guidance during the meditation. Then there'll be a period of time where it'll just be quiet. We'll be meditating together. And then we'll come out of the meditation with some more chanting. And those of you guys online, you're welcome to meditate along with us as well. These chanting sheets are on our website at buddhadailywisdom.com. You'll go there to free books and you'll be able to see the chanting sheet there. So take your position, either seated, lying, or standing. I'll teach you walking tomorrow. And then we'll do the chanting and ease into the meditation from there. O tang make one hang a piwate me. Sawaka to make wata ramo. Damang namasa me. Supati pano emakewato sawaka sanko sanghang namami napmoer hasapakewato. Arato sama samputasa napmo erhasa pakewato arato sama samputasa. Napmo erhasa pakewato arato sama samputasa iti piso emakewa ara hang sama samoto we cha cha nang samoro sakato ro ka wi tu anu tero puri sa Nama sati sata tawa manu sanang Oto pakewati Ok, 
Okay, with the lower body and hands and arms comfortable, and the upper body erect, just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just looking to establish the breath. A nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. Not forced or controlled, just a gradual inhale through the nose, experiencing the full breath. And then when you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in. And out. Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to the next inhale, breathe in gradually through the nose, developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then, whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose, experiencing the full breath. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. With the breath well established, start fixating the mind on the breath. Either the sound of the breath coming into the nose or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. and out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now 
and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go any time the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in. and out.
slowly make your way out of meditation. So this is breathing mindfulness meditation. This is a primary form of training that you're going to need to help you awaken the mind to enlightenment, eliminating cravings, desires, attachments, and developing mindfulness and concentration. So today you did two meditations in the class. Yesterday we did one. Today we did two. If you would like, you could start integrating these teachings into your life a bit by maybe trying to get a meditation in tonight, maybe before you go to sleep, no matter where you are, whether you're in a hotel or wherever you're at, maybe you can try to integrate the teachings into your life a little bit, get a meditation in. And if you can kind of consistently start building that up a little bit, little by little, it'll really have an impact for your life. So if you'd like to try to do that tonight, that might be something that you try to do tonight is get a meditation session. And even if it's just two minutes or five minutes, it's okay. You just need to kind of train the mind to have a tendency to choose to meditate because you guys have chosen to meditate now three times in the class. And then now you can maybe choose to meditate at home too. And this will help you to start building up your practice that you start choosing to do these things outside of a classroom environment that you're choosing to on your own to meditate without the teacher saying, okay, we're going to meditate now or without other classmates around that you're choosing on your own, unattached to anyone else to meditate. Okay. And then as you have questions on meditation throughout the course, just let me know. Uh, I'll pause at different times to see if you guys have questions. Um, but anytime you have a question, either during the course or after the course, you're always welcome to let me know. So tomorrow we're going to start off at nine o'clock with chanting and meditation. Then I'm going to do a talk on the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots or the three fires. 
Today, you learned about craving, desire, attachment. Tomorrow, we're going to deepen your understanding of what's really going on in the unenlightened mind. We're going to talk about craving, anger, and ignorance, or this unknowing of true reality. Then we're going to be discussing the five precepts. And then after our lunch break, we'll do walking meditation. I'll teach you guys how to do that because you're probably getting a little bit sleepy during the class, perhaps. People used to fall asleep during the lifetime of the Buddha. When he would be teaching, they would fall asleep during his class. And we might see that as rude. I don't think it's rude. I've had people fall asleep in my classes plenty of times. I know how hard the mind's working to understand these teachings. It takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of energy. So if you're feeling a little bit sleepy, if you're feeling a little bit tired sometimes, this is completely normal. If you need to go to sleep, just go to sleep. It's okay. You can sleep here and then wake up if you like. No problem. You're not being disrespectful. So I understand your mind's working hard to learn these teachings, especially after lunch, right? You can get a little bit sleepy. So um, that's what we're going to be doing tomorrow. And walking meditation will help you with that too. You can learn how to do walking meditation so you won't be so sleepy sometimes. So thank you all for your questions. Thank you for your dedication to learning and practicing. Perhaps we'll see you guys in a future class, maybe tomorrow. Okay? Sawadikap. Sawadikap. again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.